I don't like doing my own home repairs, and when I made some videos that honestly show how much I don't like it, they seem to help a lot of other guys like me. So I thought it would be good to make this new set of videos. Guys like me have a million questions for the progressive activists that we see on the news, but nobody on TV ever asks those questions. On CNN, the host probably agrees with the activists, so his questions are weak. And on Fox News, the host just tries to make them look bad. Either way, nobody's asking the questions that might actually help us get a feel for where they're coming from, so we might actually understand them a little better. It's no surprise that people who disagree over politics are so angry at each other nowadays. So right before Christmas, me and my brother, who was himself progressive, we drove around the West and did our own interviews. We drove to 22 cities and interviewed dozens of people who support progressive causes to ask those questions that are never asked. We're not trying to change our mind or make them look bad. We just want to understand where they're coming from. These folks were brave considering what can happen nowadays if you say one wrong thing on YouTube. And we talked about a lot of really sensitive subjects. So just leave right now if these conversations might offend you. If you stay though, I think you'll hear some things you've never heard before and have a better understanding of your fellow Americans. I did. That said, from Phoenix we drove to Las Cruces, New Mexico where we talked to Sharon Thomas, a former educator at Michigan State University and mayor pro tem of Las Cruces. You spent most of your time back east then, right? Or, or was it the Midwest, you're saying? Mid Michigan State University. Okay. I taught a course that was for students who were provisionally admitted to the university and, and trained the graduate students out that course. Um, it was primarily African-American kids from inner city Detroit or, or other urban areas in the state. Okay. Yeah. And you said when you came here, you um, you were very politically involved, and you got on, what was it again? The city council. The city council, and you were able to bring a lot of progressive ideas. Uh, can you explain? Well, we couldn't. We had a hard time here getting the city to do solar or curbside recycling or, you know, all those kinds of things. And um, and, and after, during those six years I was on the council working with other councilors, we managed to bring a lot of those those. Um, things to into the city so now the city has solar and most of I mean we have sunshine here <laughs> why not use solar right? um, okay well, if I can interrupt you for a second on immigration there's a whole sliding scale some people are completely open some people will want more restricted mm -hmm. how, how do you fit on that sliding it, scale? it's a huge issue here right on the border um, our federal court here has highest number of immigration cases of any federal court in the country. Um, we have several active organizations here, uh, especially CAFE, works with ACLU, they work with people who are, are being deported. Um, well, are you, so we see a lot of people who talk about unfettered immigration. I, I don't want to put words, I mean, I don't want to suggest mm -hmm. any kind of an answer, but what do you think of that? I mean, what, what do you think the problems are and the solutions are with immigration? People around here on, on the border, their lives are so intertwined with, on both sides of the border. They have family on both sides of the border. They go back and forth. People who live here work in Mexico. My daughter-in-law did all kinds of research in Mexico. That, you know, they don't really see a border. And I have learned being here because this is a, a minority majority population here. Um, you have to know some Spanish to get along. I go to a lot of meetings where I have to have the little earbuds in. I, I work a lot on the border with people, who, planners who come up from uh, Ciudad Chihuahua. You know, we have, we're working on economic development along the border. Um, people just go back and forth and they, when, when this whole issue of, oh, this is this, this border, they don't see that here. Um, Why do you think they don't see it? Because it, they I mean, haven't they haven't treated it as a border for decades. You know, they 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 and their family live on both sides. They go back and forth all the time. They, it, it's the way it is here. It's not, and um, yeah, there's the illegal. It's gone down, you know, dramatically the number of people crossing. Um, we keep doing these things. Like currently, there are all these mecadoras. Do you know what those are? No. So there are um, companies that are all along the border. I forget how many are in El Paso, but dozens. Um, cheap labor, you know, the managers usually live on this side of the border. Um, Foxconn has a huge complex planned uh, on the other side of Santa Teresa on our southern border of this county. Foxconn, you know who they are? Mm -hmm. 
They make all, if any electronic device you have, you have a Foxconn piece, piece in it. They are the the gigantic um, electronic company. They're out of Taiwan. Um, I've met the person who's in charge of Foxconn for North and South America at mayor's meetings and so on. Um, they're very definitive on m manufacturing is never coming back to the United States. They, they will tell you that point blank. But on the other hand, they're building an international campus on our border with Foxconn on one side and 101, slightly over 100 companies on this side. And they work together all the, daily. It's daily. Okay. The, the question I never hear anybody ask is, you're talking about realities, right? Mm -hmm. What's the logical end game to policies that pursue something like that? Well, if you don't want people to keep trying to come here, you can't build companies all along the border and pay them $8 a day and have them see what's right on the other side of the border. So this is the third time in our American history that we have, for some reason, brought people here short term or brought them to work right along the border. So either you have to make the working conditions in Mexico good enough that people want to stay there and work there, or you have to quit bringing them up to the border. <laughs> and you know, I mean, they Foxconn, if they, if they have a rush for on-time delivery, they just lock people in the company. You know, this is the company that in China, when people, they have dormitories for the, and when they try to jump out of the dormitory and kill themselves, they put nets up around the, so this is Foxconn, this is, this is who we're dealing with. You know, on the one hand, it's, this county has the most economic development going on for it as any place in the state because we're on the border. But on the other hand, it, it brings with us, brings economic development, but it brings all kinds of problems. Where do you come down on what Trump's approach to this has been? Well, he, he doesn't understand the culture here, the wall, and, um, you know, you can build a wall 10 feet and people will just have a 12-foot ladder. You know, I mean, they'll dig tunnels, they'll... I mean, I've seen the wall in various places. Um, it, it's the economic situation that causes them to come across the border, and we keep making it worse, you know, especially with NAFTA. So those the American companies are able to go over there and set up these maquiladoras and um, really treat these people sort of like prisoners. And well, and so you, you ha it's a policy change you have to do. It's, you know, the wall's not going to do anything. It's, it's, you have to change the policies. You can't have these people making $8 an hour right smack up against our border. If Trump frog walked some CEOs, some American CEOs who are doing this, would you be happy? You know, if, if he you, what? If he frog walked them into prison. No, yeah. no, no, no. There, there are plenty of American CEOs who would get on board to making, uh, the working conditions more equal. There are plenty of CEOs that will do that. But you, you, you sound very, very well versed. You probably, you, I mean, I'm sure you probably heard of the Bracero program. I remember watching something that was made during the 50s. It basically said, you know what? If we don't have the Braceros, then we're simply going to lose agribusiness. So it was, it was all just a cynical. Okay, we don't want to lose tax revenue, mm -hmm. so we'll do this idiotic thing. You know, we want a workforce. What we got was a population. I mean, it right. seems like people keep making that mistake over and over yeah, again. Yeah, that's the other time when we brought all these people. We said you can come across the border for a certain period of time, and so then you show them what they might like to have and the life they might. What are they going to do? Try to get it. <laughs> you know, you do the same thing. Okay, so we're in agreement. This is a huge mess. Yeah. And all I can see is Trump being the one guy saying, this is screwed up, we gotta fix it. I mean, maybe he's the blunt instrument that's doing it the wrong way, yeah. but. Well, I don't think he's the only one that sees it as a mess and that's screwed up. I think a lot of people see that. Um, they just didn't happen to be people in power. And it, it's, um, you know, El Paso, for example, it says a very high immigrant population, and it's the second safest city in the United States for its size. So they were very, very hurt to have those kinds of things said about them. What's the solution if not a blunt instrument like Trump? Well, like I keep saying, it's, it's an economic situation. And so as long as, as we're willing to 
let all those workers be exploited, whether it's a Bracero program or whether it's the Macadoras, what we always exploit those workers and tempt them. So, um, you know, under Obama, they had more deportations, a real high number of deep. They were deporting people like crazy. Um, and that doesn't work either. You know, it, it, NAFTA, okay, you, you were, NAFTA you, needs to be renegotiated. I just want to, you were aware that they redefined what deporting was too at that point. I mean, that's one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. We could argue, and I don't want yeah. to argue statistics in this. Yeah. Well, how would you explain? It sounds like what you're saying is look, this is a complex situation. It's a ridiculously complex. I don't believe oversimplifications. How would you explain what the, um, what the prognosis of this is? You know, you're saying it has to be done through, um, through reducing the, uh, the, the economic yeah, disparities. The, the economic dis disparities. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole um, there's a whole system. There's a whole group of people, and they do work with the because um, I've met with them with the um, National Chamber of Commerce. They've been here, so have some of the um, business people from the from D.C. So that there's this whole mayor's program along the border. All the places that there are, like El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, and those kinds of places all along the border. There are about eight of them. And all of those mayors have attempted to work together, and they work quite well with um, with the various um, CEOs that have companies along there. So I, I would say that that would be a group to start with. They know all the problems extremely well. Um, they know what the culture is along the border. Um, I think you need, but like I say, it's a NAFTA and the Macadoras are the, that's our new Bracero program. And NAFTA has to be redone. We've had people here move their entire Chile operation to Mexico. Um, my uncle in uh, Indiana lost his hog operation because the processing plant moved to Mexico. So as long as those things keep happening, we keep diminishing our economic development and, and it's not helping and it's just causing another big immigration problem. All this complexity that you've described, no doubt it sounds true. I mean, you know better than I do. This all sounds true. And you have people who have lost jobs, who have lost income. It's not just the border that is being affected by this. It's, it's people oh. in Delaware, people in the Midwest, mm -hmm. construction okay. industry. Well, all especially we, the, biggest, the biggest thing that's done, the biggest industry in, um, in, the, in Chihuahua, the Mexican state, is, is automotive. Huge, huge automotive plants down there. So all, that's where all the Detroit jobs went. Okay. So can you, what would you say when, when people who are, have my opinion are being called racist for having legitimate concerns? I, I, what, I'm, what I would hope to hear from somebody who you know, has a progressive opinion is we understand why this is painful to you. And, you know, and, and yes, we can agree that you're not racist. Would it be fair to say that folks who have these concerns have legitimate concerns that go beyond, you know, this, this the, the, accusation that's, of that's, racism? That's the history of our country, all right? So, I mean, our, the, our whole history is we get a bunch of immigrants, everybody hates them, goes after them, because they, they're afraid of them. They're afraid they're going to, you know, so it's, it's the Italians, it's the Irish, it's what, you know, they get all kinds of nicknames. It's, because people are afraid, sure. I mean, yeah, I understand that. It's, it's always been like that in this country. We wave after wave after wave. And when all the African Americans started coming north to take jobs in, during World War II, same thing. You know? uh, and so now it's focused along the border where, where, like I keep saying, we have like a magnet attracted these people and lined them up along the border and made it, made, um, made them want to come here because of what we've done through their country, especially with NAFTA. In some ways, people in Mexico now have better jobs, sort of. And, but I mean, I was in Mexico, I don't know, last year, with, and we were traveling with the economic development people from the state of Chihuahua, and they were, and all over Ciudad Juarez are these signs, the, come work at the Macador, you know, and they tell how much they pay, and I asked the guy, so can the family live on that? And he said, well, maybe, if the husband and wife both work. You know, I mean, I paid $2 to buy a little thing of peanuts, and they're making $8 a day. 
not going to work. <laughs> so I, I understand that people are afraid and they think they're going to take their jobs. In, in fact, more jobs are lost to mechanization and shipping jobs to someplace else, China or what, India. Well, I, I would admit there's probably a component of Trump support that's racist, but um, I just see us being tarred as all being racist. Yeah, well, yeah, we get tarred as progressives too. I mean, I got called, I had to go be on TV here and do a half hour show on what does, does Las Cruces need progressives? You know, you know, I mean, when they're constantly our letters and to, to the editor about how awful we are, and you know, we just want to raise taxes and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, I, I know what's going to make this city uh, work. I know what's going to bring workers here. I know how we're going to get the millennials and the, and the good companies and the good jobs. And I, so I'm going to keep working on it. Okay. But, and it sounds like the American worker who's lost in, the, in that, who feels like Trump is his only you know, right. uh, advocate, He's just kind of lost in all this complexity. Well, we don't. Ha we're we're not doing anything to to help people who have lost jobs due to mechanization. We have no huge workforce. You know, I just spent the last year working on a workforce program here, and we, you know, we got nowhere. I, what I work with a transit Listen, district, oh. and people's biggest job problem is they d don't have transportation to get to the job or get to the training. And can we get money for public transportation? No. But mechanization is something that's, I mean, it's not a political situation. This is, you know, you, you've said this is, this is something, this is involves huge organizations that are making decisions that are, are, are disrespectful of borders, etc. So mechanization, we can't do anything about. This is something we can do something about. You can do something about mechanization. You can help people get the skills they need. I mean, we're working now on trying to get the community college. I work with the director of the two campuses closest to the border. She's trying to work with people, those businesses along the border. What do you need us to train people to do so that they can get these jobs? But there's very poor communication between those two groups. Okay, fair enough. Well, I appreciate it. So ends this interview in our Drive to Understand series. You know, I've been watching people do interviews about immigration for years, but I've never heard before someone with Sharon Thomas's working knowledge of border town economies, Mechiadoras, the Bracero program, etc., etc. I mean, she identifies so plainly why all of this is happening. It makes you wonder why the folks who do interviews for a living don't talk to people like her. So we might get the specifics to help us to understand the situation better. I hope you may want to support this series by liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Thanks.